Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week Canto, number one from IDW Publishing. This is an all-ages fantasy adventure that's rich with metaphor, rich with thematic relevancy, um, and great detailed textured artwork. It's fantastic. I really did like it. It's written by David M. Boer, with artwork by Drew Zucker, and colors by Vittorio Astoni, lettering by Darren Bennett. The entire team comes together and crafts something truly unique, truly special, which is a highly engaging and compelling all ages fantasy book like something that really almost anybody can just get right into this book found a direct connection to my soul at least that's my perspective on it right tugged at all the right heartstrings at all the right moments it's basically about a race of people that have been enslaved for generations their hearts have been replaced with clocks right and they just have to slave away until their clocks or their time runs out it's got lots of easily thinly veiled metaphor but it's also got some really deep rich nuanced thematic elements in there as well and even though this is an all ages fantasy adventure it does not come across as unsophisticated whatsoever as far as the artwork goes zucker s tony do an amazing job with the artwork with the composition the layout the story the characters are instantly likable instantly relatable very compelling very engaging this just seriously it made me feel it made me chuckle it made me feel that thrill of adventure this book had it all great setup to the story cannot wait to see where the six issue series is going to blossom fantastic stuff seriously correct uh, amazing job from the entire creative team canto number one my pick of the week so be sure to snag a copy if you get it i believe it's already sold out at diamond so snag them while you can that book was really cool and would easily be easily translatable into other mediums as well um marilyn manor number one is another one from idw this week idw killed it this week they won the week they, they really did pretty much. Marilyn Manor is a new one, written by Magdalene Visaggio with artwork by Marley Zarconi. Um, really did like this one. Zarconi was the artist over on Shade, the Changing Girl and Woman, um, over at DC Young Animal, if you remember. Magdalene Visaggio did Eternity Girl over there, so it's really cool to see that flamboyant flair being brought to this book. It's set in the early 80s. I think Visaggio has kind of described it as if John Hughes did some kind of crazy weird sci-fi movie back in the 80s or whatever. Anyway, the title character Marilyn is the first daughter of the President of the United States. And while the President and the First Lady are away, she decides she's going to throw a party to end all parties at the White House. This book is fun. It's out there. It's got great psychedelically influenced artwork at times. Really weird, off-the-wall type stuff. But it really connects with the character, with the understanding. And even though the main character is kind of a spoiled brat, she is instantly relatable and very likable as well. Marilyn Manor, number one, I thought was a really solid debut this week from IDW. We also have some really cool continuing issues from IDW. Road of Bones, number two, is out this week. It is written by Rich Duick with uh, artwork by Alex McCormick. I really did like issue number one, and I got an early look at issue number two, and I reread it again just now. Loved it. Fantastic book. Survival horror. Historical horror. It's set in like the 50s. Um, in, the so in the Soviet Union, the gulags, these prisoners escape from this terrible gulag. They're all terrible, right? And they're off in this wilderness, and the story gets rich. Um, it gets deeper. It gets more suspenseful. It gets more thrilling. It gets more mysterious. And once the, once the hook is revealed in this issue, it's very effective. The pacing, um, everything about it, the flow, the composition, the artwork, the lettering, the writing, it all works together in conjunction to make that moment really shine and really happen. Road of Bones number two was even better than issue number one. That's a hard thing to do in a comic book, but this was a great second issue of a great miniseries, and I'm super pumped to see where it's going to go. A fantastic job by the creative team. Road of Bones number two, out this week. Also from IDW, we got Ghost Tree number three. I've really, really been liking this one. Issue three was a super solid issue, one of the best ones yet. Really hits everything thematically, very directly even. This is basically about a dude who's running away from his problems. He's running away into his past. He's running away into his, his family home. He's even revisiting the literal ghosts of his past. So at the, in the back of his family's estate, there's a tree and ghosts are 
are connected to it. They just show up and they hang out around this tree, right? It's a ghost tree. Um, so this dude, just like his grandfather, has the gifts that they can see this ghost. So this dude sees a ghost of one of his old flames, right? So he's having problems with his wife in the States. He goes back overseas, back to his, his home to see his grandmother, I believe, um, where his grandfather lived. And he finds out he can see these ghosts and he's kind of running away from his problems. And the way that it's, it's not so over the top, it's just very masterfully done. This book has been very impressive. It's written by Bobby Curno, artwork by Simon Gain. I really, really like Simon Gain's artwork. It's simple line work, but it's elegant composition and the facial expressions, the characters, um, emotions, all that stuff really comes across. The lettering is superb in this one as well by Herring. Absolutely loved it. If you haven't checked it out yet, I highly encourage you. I think there are new printings of issue number one and two out this week, as well as new printings of Road of Bones. IDW killed it. They also had this really silly one out today, Transformers Ghostbusters. I would recommend this one if you're a super, super hardcore fan of either of these properties, or especially if you're a super, super hardcore. you got to be a super hardcore fan of both of them. All together, it's all right. It's silly. It's kind of like your typical Transformer Ghostbuster licensed IDW type product. It's not going to change your life, but there's something there. It's fun. Lots of throwbacks, lots of callbacks, things like that. It's an interesting little setup kind of transformer ghosts and how it relates to the ghostbusters and all that kind of stuff but ultimately it just didn't do too much for me but it is the debut in comic book for, uh, form at least of uh what's it the ectotron what do they call it's the ecto one meet met with a transformer what did they call that the ecto the ecto oh there it is right there yeah the ectotron right there so that's kind of cool that toy is kind of cool, too. We're just going to roll right on through some of the smaller publishers. Killer Groove number two is out from Aftershock Comic Books. This one is awesome. I really liked issue number one. Issue two takes exactly what was established in issue number one and keeps ramping it up. Gets it, uh, it handles the tone and the mood great. It just masterfully does that with the artwork and the writing. Everything together, the lettering, the coloring, it all makes one great crime fiction comic book set in the 70s. It's kind of thematically about the death of a dream and, and what do we do to continue on to what, what how far would you go to, to feel inspired again once you've lost that inspiration. But Killer Groove's basically about a dude who becomes a hitman because it inspires him to write better music. And that's a pretty cool idea in and of itself, but the character nuances, everything that's in here, it's delicate, it's subtle, really good at line work. I really like the artwork, love the coloring, love the lettering. This is just a fantastic book all the way through and exactly what you love about crime fiction. If you're a fan of crime fiction like I am, it's all in Killer Groove, so be on the lookout for that. Category Zero, number two, is out this week from Scout Comics from writer Adam Camel, uh, Camel and illustrator Todd Lima, colorist uh, Ton Lima, my bad, and Derek Dow on the coloring. Issue number two was actually better than issue number one, and I gave issue number one a very favorable review. I thought it was a great, great comic book. It does, in issue number two, get a little bit more of that X-Men vibe to it, but it's something that's really compelling, and it really jumps off the page, those characters do, and they grab you. Um, after the jarring events at the end of issue number one, where do we go from here? And seriously, Ed M does a great job of continuing this story, of making us jump right back into it and feel and forgive him for the way that issue number one left off bring us right back into it very interested in seeing where this one's gonna go but issue two was a really really solid like I said it was even better than issue one it was a really solid continuation of the story category zero number two from Scout Comics get it this week Ascender number three is out from Image Comics this book is amazing. I love Descender. I thought it was great. I loved science fiction. Now it's set 10 years later. It's got some of the same characters, but some new characters and a whole new story, a whole new element. Because this one's not science fiction. This one's fantasy. And I'm way more of a sci-fi guy than I am a fantasy guy. But man, Ascender is just great. It hits all those notes that Dustin Wynn and Jeff Lemire did in Descender. And, and it continues on with that thread, but it does something on its own that Descender didn't do as well. And the artwork is amazing. The colors, everything about this book is so freaking cool. The familiar characters really are just a treat and a joy. There's a lot of similarities between this and Descender, but there are a lot of differences. And those similarities, some similarities and those differences make Ascender such an amazing comic book. I cannot wait to see where this is going to go because it ain't even started yet. Ascender number three out this week. Isola number eight is out this week. This book comes out so randomly now. When I read an issue, I kind of don't remember where we left off, but it doesn't matter because that artwork just immediately draws me in. That is gorgeous. The coloring is so subtle and still so in your face. It is luminescent. The composition, uh, everything about it, so elegant about this book. And even if I don't remember exactly what's going on in the story, the art brings me in, and then that story 
starts penetrating into my mind and it starts coming back. It starts coming back slowly. Isola is a rare treat when it comes out, but when it comes out, it is a treat. It is delectable. Again, with issue number eight out this week. Redneck number 21 is out this week from Image Comics. Writer Donnie Cates doing a fantastic job with this one. Taking vampire lore, established vampire lore, and doing his own spin on it. Really cool stuff. Vampire set at the border at Texas and Mexico. Real fun stuff. Um, I've enjoyed Redneck so far, but this issue really starts adding some new elements. And Donnie Cates has really been expanding uh, the, the lore of his Redneck world, and he's doing a masterful job with it. Um, the coloring, uh, the pencils, everything about it's fantastic. If you've been loving Redneck, you're not gonna not like this one. Redneck number 21 was a great, exciting chapter and had one panel that was just one of the most horrific panels I've seen in a comic book in a long time. Let's jump over to Boom because I'm super excited about Power Rangers number 40. This is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 40. I haven't really been liking the Beyond the Grid story, so I kind of fell out of it, even stopped reading it, but I've been waiting for this day. I love Power Rangers. Self-confessed Power Rangers fan. A lot of y'all know that about me. Um, but my absolute favorite era of Power Rangers is season two, when Tommy went from green to white, when, when Adam and Aisha and Rocky came in, um, when they got the Thunder Megazord, when they got the White Tiger Zord. So this is the jump, finally. Um, first of all, new writer, Ryan Parrott, who has been writing Go Go Power Rangers, which in my opinion has been the best Power Rangers comic book we've ever had, is now on the main title, and it's set when Tommy is the White Ranger. It spins out of some of the events from Shattered Grid. It's got a nice little prologue, reminds you of stuff. The artwork is great. The story is great. I loved it. It's got this crazy cool foil cover. Pfft. Pfft. Power Ranger fans. You're going to love this issue. It's awesome because it also adds some elements to it that we never really got before. Like, maybe Tommy doesn't really feel that great about Jason and Trini and Zach just up and leaving them to fight this war on their own, right? But it adds so many new layers to that story that we've never seen, especially the hook at the end. <laughs> it's also just really exciting to see Lord Zed in a comic book again. Super exciting. Angel number two is out from writer Brian. Um, Edward Hill, Gleb. Mel Nakov, Nuk I messed that up. The artwork is great. Very horrific. Exactly what it needs to be. This is a decent, faithful adaptation of the original show, but kind of moved forward into today's world. Um, the Buffy world has been pretty good. I've been liking what they've been doing. This Angel book, it does capture that tone. It's not as solid so far to me as the Buffy comic book, but it's got some great dialogue. It's got some great pacing, some great artistic um, composition inside of there. Angel number two, though, for me, was a winner, especially if you're a fan of the show. From Boombox, we got Avant Guards number six. This story about an all-girls basketball school at an all-girls art school, or an all, wait, a basketball team at an art school, right? This book has been amazing. It's been absolutely splendid. This issue is no exception. Illustrated by Noah Hayes. Colors by Rebecca Nolte. Carly Usden is the writer. They have all done a fantastic job on this one. Instantly intriguing characters. Instantly relatable and likable characters. The character work that's, that just shines through here. The artwork is great. The compositions, the layout, the way you handle um, showing a basketball game and just still a... Uh, uh, you know, just a series of still images. The coloring, everything about this just pops. It's a very poppy book, a very fun book, and a very character-driven book that I absolutely adore. The Avant Garde's number six, out this week from Titan. It is, no, it's Lion Forge, my bad. From Lion Forge and their Roar imprint. It's At the End of Your Tether. It's a big, thick one um, by Adam Glass, VB Gla uh, Adam Smith, VB Glass, Hillary Jenkins. Um, the artwork is good. The story is intriguing. It takes a long time to get there. It's really, like I said, it's pretty thick. It's got a lot of pages to it. Um, it's got a nice pace to it. It's got a nice flow to it as well. The dialogue is great. Um, the character work is great. At times it gets a little bit confusing. Maybe it does a little few jumps in time that you quite don't quite pick up on at first, or at least I didn't. It is engaging. It is intriguing, but it doesn't feels like something's missing. It feels like with the amount of time that I invested into reading this, I shouldn't know more about what's going on, but it does kind of hook you at the end. And like I said, I did like the characters. I like the, the composition. I like the approach. I like the pacing of it. There's just something felt like it was just a, like something was missing. Something was missing there. From Ahoy Comics, we have Steel Cage. Number one, this is an interesting idea. So it's Tom Payer, Stuart Moore, and Mike, uh, Mark, Mark Wade. Mike Wade? Mark Wade. Mark Wade. Um, it's the three of them doing three different stories, and everybody's going to go online and vote which one they like, and maybe it will come back or something like that. So it's got three interesting, weird little stories in it. None of them really did anything for me. To me, the best one was the Mark Wade one at the end. But so far, 
I haven't been that impressed with Ahoy Comics. I want to, though. I want to really like it. Black Mask Studios, I believe, comes out with Nobody is in Control number two. Issue one was intriguing enough to me. I do like the artistic approach of this book. Um, I like the way that uh, the composition is done. I like the way that the, the pages are laid out and the story flows. Um, but this one's all over the place, and it's really starting to lose me. Some of the conspiracy theory ideas are really, really neat, and that's something that kind of was a great thread throughout issue number one. And issue number two, it lost me so many different times. I just was kind of like struggling to get through it. But at the end, it did have an intriguing revelation that made me maybe think about coming back for issue number three. Maybe. But it just didn't grab me overall at all. Let's go over to the big two. DC finally releases the final issue of Batman Dam. Batman Dam number three is out this week. And now that we know the end, oh, I get what you were doing, Azarello. Eh, I don't know. I didn't really like this one. I never liked it all the way through. I thought the the controversy about the, the bat pole, Lil Wayne, was, was really, really funny and outrageous. Um, but this story just didn't do anything for me. It's got great artwork. Lee Bermejo's artwork is great. But the story to me is... Really, really just not up to the best of Brian Azzarello's work. Like, look at things like his Wonder Woman run. I love that stuff, right? This just doesn't... I don't know. It's like one good idea that just was wrapped around in a bunch of fluff with some really nice artwork. But it took too long to come out, and ultimately Batman Damned just leaves me feeling a little flat. Detective Comics 1006 is here. Um, it's a new story by Peter Tomasi. Kyle Hotz on the artwork. That's awesome, especially because the Spectre is in this issue. Kyle Hotz's artwork, to me, is perfectly appropriate for something like the Spectre. Um, all in all, though, the story was very confusing. I don't feel like it did a great job of reintroducing this character because there are going to be a lot of people, I think, nowadays are going to read this book that aren't that familiar with the Spectre. Now, I got familiar with him back in the uh, Ostrander um, Mandrake days. That was really, really good stuff. Um, but this Detective Comics issue, I love the artwork, but the story didn't really do anything for me. Didn't really grab me, didn't really hold me, didn't intrigue me, especially as excited as I was that the Spectre was coming back. Action Comics 1012 is here with such an amazingly elegant cover. That cover is awesome. Um, the issue itself, though, I don't know, didn't really do much for me. It's got artwork by uh, Zyman uh, Kudransky, the guy that does The Punisher, I believe. And the art's pretty decent. There's some awesome little layouts and pages and stuff in there. There's a little bit of Rose Thorn action in there. Um, but ultimately, the Superman books are starting to just wear thin on me. They're starting to fall flat for me. And Action Comics 1012 was no exception to me. Like, it just feels like it's just... It doesn't feel like it's directionless, but it just feels like... It's not enough purpose in that direction. I don't know. Justice League Dark number 12 is here, wrapping up this whole Lords of Order storyline, and it does it in a magnificent fashion. Seriously, James Tiny and the Fourth and Company have really crafted something really unique and special with this, especially the ending of this book. Um, I'm really, really liking this one. Justice League Dark, you also get a little bit of revelation about what exactly happened when Wonder Woman decided to form the Justice League Dark. Um, I really like this issue. I like what it's building up to. Um, this was a great wrap-up to the Lords of Order thing, and I'm very, very excited to see what's going to happen in the next issue. Absolutely. The Flash number 73 is here with Flash Year One. One of the weakest chapters so far in Flash Year One, and mostly only because there's just a lot of talking in there and not a lot of motion and action. But there is a lot of that in there as well, but it did just kind of feel a little uneven for me. Maybe a little bit too much uh, melodrama there. Just a, just a smidgen. Just a little smidgen of that CW influence. But all in all, I've really been liking this year one story. Howard Porter's churning out some great artwork, doing a great um, visual uh, doing a great visual style for the year one, making the Flash feel fast even when it does come across as slow. Some interesting developments about the turtle. Seems like Joshua Williamson really wants us to think the turtle's a threat. And you're convincing me, homie. Absolutely. The Flash number 73 out this week. Dial H for Hero number 4 is here with the best issue of this series yet. It's fun. It's filled with great character moments. It makes fun of itself and Snapper Carr so many times. I love the all the various new heroes that you get to come out with. Sam Humphreys um, and uh, uh, Quinones are doing an absolutely fantastic job in here. I don't want to spoil anything, but it was really, really funny. It was very humorous. It was, it was such a fun, joyous ride all the way throughout. And it was a book that didn't take itself too seriously. But it's really, really fun. Dial H for Hero number four out this week. Let's jump over to Marvel. First of all, the big thing, War of the Realms number six. That's the finale of War of the Realms. And it's a huge, epic finale, albeit predictable. 
Um, you could pretty much see this ending coming from a mile away, but it was still fun to watch it unfold before our eyes, especially with Dodderman and Wilson on the line work and the coloring. The artwork in this book is majestically splendid. It is beautiful. It's elegant. There are big moments in here. Big moments have been a long time coming. Jason Aaron does a great job of also making it feel really big and connected to to, to a lot of different mythologies, not just Norse mythology. Really cool stuff here with War of the Realms number six. All in all, War of the Realms tie-ins were just worthless, but a lot of stuff did happen. Those tie-ins didn't really matter though. The main series was pretty cool. Um, I really love the artwork. I love the epic scope of it, but it did have a very predictable ending. I think anybody could have guessed this ending. Anyway, it's here and it's done. Now we can move on to Absolute Carnage, right? Absolutely, that's the next big thing, right? Thor number 14 is here with the War of the Realms tie-in. Read this first before you read any of the tie-ins. This um, illuminates a little bit of some moments from War of the Realms number 6. It really focuses on the young version of Thor. That's a really cool cover, by the way, um, by Del Mundo. He does not do the interior artwork, but the artwork's all right, but not quite what we're used to in this book. But Thor number 14 was decent and a serviceable um, tie-in. Same thing with Avengers number 20. This is a big She-Hulk focused issue. So as far as a tie-in to War of the Realms, kind of meaningless. But as far as a character study on She-Hulk and where Jennifer Walters is as a character right now, excellent work. Excellent work. Absolutely good stuff by Jason Aaron, Ed McGinnis, and company. Um, other than that though, hmm, they're all right. They're all right. Amazing Spider-Man number 24 is here finally with a hunted free story. With a hunted free story, but of course we still feel the ramifications of that. This one is a nice spotlight, a little bit on Mysterio, and on the new upcoming Spider-Villain. That guy right there that they've been building up to. Spencer and all in all has been doing a good job, but I am wearing myself... I'm, I've been weared thin with the whole hunted story. They just kept going and going and going. So, we'll see what happens. This one, you know, we'll see. We'll have to see. What, we'll see what's next. We'll see what's next. Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number 8 is here with a pretty decent issue. The artwork's not quite as good as when Cabal's on the artwork. But the colors still flare and the story's still nice. And Tom Taylor's got a great story going on here. Great characterization of Peter Parker and the world around him. So I actually like this one a little bit better than Amazing Spider-Man. Even with Otley back on the artwork. The Otley artwork on this one to me felt just a little bit rushed. And it just feels like we're about to launch into another big epic Spidey story. And didn't we didn't one just end? I mean, I'm sorry. Even if Hunted wasn't the big epic Spider-Man story, what was that? Like 12 parts or something? Peter Porker, the, spe the spectacular Spider-Ham, returns in the Spider-Man annual out this week. Um, Jason Latour wrote this one, did a little bit of the artwork as well. Um, it's silly, it's fun. I'm a huge Spider-Ham fan. It was back when I was a kid. I couldn't get enough Spider-Ham. Um, so I enjoyed this. I really, really did. But if you're not a hardcore Spider-Ham fan, it's easily skippable. We'll talk about Spider-Ham a little bit later. Fantastic Four number 11 is here with another one of these one and done fun Fantastic Four stories that really focuses in on them as a family. It took a while to get them back, and once they came back, it took a while to get them back and settled, but now it feels like the Fantastic Four are settled. It feels like Dan Slott is settled into the role of writer, into the role of the characters, into the role of the book and the pace and everything like that. The artwork was not my favorite so far in the series in this issue, but it is solid and does get the job done. Do like the story, the characters, they're starting to ring truer to me. And like I said, it feels like Dan Slott starting to settle down a little bit as the writer of this book and the story is just feeling a little bit more familiar, a little bit more like home for a longtime Fantastic Four fan. Issue number 11 is out this week. Mr. and Mrs. X number 12, the final issue of the uh, Kelly Thompson series that turned me into a Rogue and Gambit fan. So it's a great finale. It's exactly what we've come to expect. Great fun dialogue. Um, really witty, witty back and forth banner, and a real nice spotlight on the romance on Rogue and Gambit and on those characters. Kelly Thompson, these characters were great in your hands. You turned me absolutely into a fan. I love it. Sad to see this book end, but thank you so much for adding a new layer of experience to my life, being a Rogue and Gambit fan, and in fact, being a fan of them together. I will never forget I'll never forget that. That was all due to Kelly Thompson and the amazing artists that she worked with, the editors, the letterers, the colorists, and all that stuff. Mr. and Mrs. X was... I really... <laughs> I loved that book. I loved it. And I'm still kind of just, wow, that book was so good. That book was so good. X-Men Grand Design, um, Extinction, number two. That's the final issue of Ed Piscor's big, giant retelling of X-Men history up to a point, up to the 90s. But it's fun, and this was great. It's real cool stuff, and it's going to be really neat to sit down and read through all of it. But it feels like that's one of the most meticulous comic book projects that have ever been done. It really does. Wolverine Exit Wounds is here. It's a one-shot. Um, there's going to be a lot of these one-shots re, you know, reuniting 
celebrated creative teams from characters past, celebrating Marvel's 80th year. Um, Wolverine Exit Wounds is one of those. It's got a story by Larry Hama. It's got a story by Chris Claremont and Salvador LaRocca. And it's got a story by Sam Keith. All of them were okay. The Sam Keith one was the best because I love Sam Keith's artwork and it's got Venom in it. But all in all, they were okay. Hardcore Wolverine fans, you'll like it. If you're not a hardcore Wolverine fan, I don't know. Conan the Barbarian, number seven. Jason Aaron, doing a great job on Thor. Doing a good job with War of the Realms. Doing an amazing job on Conan the Barbarian. Seven issues in, I'm still reading it. I'm not into this kind of stuff at all. I'm still reading this book. That means it's good. Enough said. Enough said. Star Wars Age of the Rebellion. Darth Vader number one. So this is the final one of the Age of the Rebellion one shots, which to me have been way better than the Age of the Republic one shots. Now I know that we can say, well, that's prequel era. So obviously these ones that are original trilogy era would be better. Well, maybe, but it's also just Greg Peck understands these characters. He did a great job with these ones. This Vader story is really, really fun. A nice one shot, one and done story about Vader that's pretty badass. You can walk in off the street into any comic book shop. You can get on your tablet and go over to Comixology and just download it or whatever, right? And you will enjoy it if you're a Vader fan. It's just Vader being Vader. It's Vader being badass. And the best Vader comic books are that. Greg Pak did a great job with the Star Wars Age of the Rebellion one shots. Next week, the Age of Resistance one start. Let's see what happens. A couple trades I want to point out. First of all, Interceptor, the trade paperback by Donnie Cates is out this week. Dylan Burnett on the artwork. This was originally published, I think, by 2000 AD. Vault has the rights because they've been publishing the sequel, Reactor. Um, it's a great book. There was a free comic book day issue from Vault this year. That, to me, was the pick of free comic book day. Um, that was the first issue of this. I'm very excited to read the rest of it. Vampires, Vampires in Space by Donnie Cates and D Dylan Burnett. Sold, sold, so sold. There are two more vault books that are out this week in trade paperback. Wasted Space, Volume 2, and Fearscape. You definitely need to get these. Read these books if you haven't already. Vault Comics is cranking out some of the best comic books out on the market. Fearscape is one of the most unique comic book experiences you're, you're ever going to have. It's absolutely brilliant. Wasted Space is fun, and it says so much about society and the world and science fiction. Um, really good stuff. My shop got shorted. The other two vault books. We always get shorted our vault books. But at least we got Interceptor. Anyway, be on the lookout for those vault trades out this week. And finally, we said we'd talk more about Spider-Ham. Peter Porker, the spectacular Spider-Ham complete collection trade paperback has finally been released by Marvel. I have waited for this day since I was a little kid. I have so many of these issues, but I do not have them all. I do not have them all really nicely repackaged in one fun collection together. So there it is, and I am so, so stoked to check out these books from the original Spider-Ham series back in the 80s. I loved that stuff. I was, a, I was ridiculously obsessed. And I remember there was an issue of What The that I loved so much because it was the Spider-Ham of 2099, Pigel. <laughs> Man, that's some good stuff. I'm going to have to go dig that one out. Anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What do you think about it? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video and you're supporting this channel. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.